Um, so without wasting time, I'm just going to bring to the stage Matthew Watson, who is the Global Head of Sales for Rystad Energy. Please, a round of applause for him, please. Yes, uh, good day, everybody, and really exciting to be here. I'm actually based in Norway, despite the South African accent. Um, I came from snow yesterday to sun today, so it's, it's been great. And uh, just came from uh, moderating a panel on hydrogen um, and now to uh, the upstream room. So I'm jumping around and having different topics. Uh, those of you who, who don't know too much about us, I think it's important to keep context in terms of what I'm going to show you. Um, Rise State Energy is, a, is an independent knowledge house. We're ultimately a consulting advisory house working with um, corporates, governments, financiers globally on anything kind of under that energy umbrella. And our approach is very fundamental. We, we're, we're, we're ultimately doing this. And some of you who have ever seen a presentation from us would probably have seen this. This is our world that we live in. We track granularly, asset by asset, project by project, molecule by molecule, the full journey of energy through the production, refining, storage, and electrification to consumption. And, and the reason I'm telling you this is, is I want to show you some of the takeaways in terms of how we see energy transition playing out, and then really tie this back to Africa, right? What do, what do we see the challenges within Africa? And, you know, with COP26 going on, all these different temperature degree scenarios, you know, how feasible are these, and what fundamentally needs to happen to make this take place and what are the roles, I think, of different players, which I think is going to be exciting to hear from the panel in terms of how they approach the storyline. So this is basically built into what we call our energy scenario cube. I won't go into this too much, but this is just a big tool, which I'm going to show you some of the takeaways. So think about it as an equation. I'm going to show you some of the outcomes of the equation in terms of how that looks. And the most obvious one, uh, if you're talking about anything to do with energy transition, it's all about net zero. And that's ultimately how do we reduce emissions, or how do we eliminate emissions? And what you can see, you know, leveraging our data and, 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 and our understanding of the kind of granularity and activity and costs associated with what's happened, how can this play out? These are the different scenarios. I think you're all familiar that the, the fundamental scenario people talk about and that is being discussed at a global level is the 1.5 degree scenario, uh, which is basically this line here. But you've got other scenarios. The most kind of dramatic would be 1.4 degree, which we're basically saying we're, we're, we're eliminating all emissions and getting to net zero, net zero uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, now, the obvious thing would be, well, why don't we just do the blue line? I mean, that seems the best. It's the fastest, so let's just do that one. Of course, it's not that easy because there's lots of other factors to kind of assess, you know, how feasible is this? And this is all underpinned by different projects, activities. And the most obvious um, restrictor in terms of how you can address these is the economics. So if you look at the economics of this, this is just looking at upstream and midstream. You can talk about the downstream and grid, and within Africa, this is a huge contextual conversation by itself. But if you're just talking about investments in terms of getting the assets, the actual energy volumes into play, to do that 1.4, which looked very attractive, you've got to take what's basically a $2 trillion investment in energy and take it to $4 trillion. Okay, so you're basically doubling it. I think we all agree that's unrealistic. But even um, the 1.5 degree, we are going to have to see steep increases in spend. So it's not just switching what we're investing in, it's, it's actually increasing the spend, which, again, you could argue is unrealistic. So the 1.6 is probably the most feasible one, where we can expect to invest at similar levels as we've seen historically. But of course, what we're investing in changes. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Now, you take the investments and then we look at the underpinning energy types. Now, this is uh, probably the one that most people are familiar with. This is kind of the oil consumption or the oil demand curves. And, and what you can see here in different scenarios is how much more growth we've got. And I think we all agree there will be a decline. It's when that decline happens and how steep that is. Uh, the most aggressive one basically says we're going to write off oil pretty much. We're well, down to 10 uh, million barrels per day uh, within kind of 20 years. I think that's unrealistic. You're probably looking at somewhere in the region of 60 to 65 million barrels by 2040. Um, and of course, that is still sizable in terms of where we are. We were at 100. We're now around 90. So there's a, a sizable offsetting of that. But of course, that has to be substituted by something else. It's not a case that people want less energy. It's kind of delivering that in a different form. And we'll, we'll look a bit more into detail. On gas, it's even more dramatic in terms of spread, and, and that's really because of the role that gas plays within electrification and the whole switching element, coal to gas, and of course, the whole renewable piece. You know, how quickly we can scale up, how we can deal with intermittency, storage, and so on, will, will 
either decrease or increase the relevance of gas when it comes to the energy mix. And of course, that's strategies that everybody here is talking about. I think in Africa, gas has a significant role to play. Um, probably different to other countries where energy transition is very much moving away from gas. It is, gas plays a very, very fundamental role in terms of how Africa is transitioning. And of course, the transition here is about energy availability as much as it is um, the cleanliness of that. So, so, so again, this gives you a, a bit of a taste of how it works. If you look at solar, you know, the, the steepness of ramp up and you know, what we're basically saying here is, is this would go from pretty much nothing to uh, 40,000 terawatt hours uh, in, in, in a very, very short space of time. That's not realistic, but the reality is solar can scale up quite quickly. Uh, the lead times for solar projects isn't that big. There's a lot of willingness to invest in this. And of course, Africa is huge opportunity space for this. Of course, there's grid issues and, and infrastructure issues that go with this, but the ability to bring this online is very quick. The question is, you know, how quickly should we do it? Because if you look at it from a capacity point of view, you've got to remember that renewable energy is not a, a, a natural resource, i.e. you're not burning it, it is not um, um, declining, and doesn't consistently have to be replaced. So, so the more capacity you build, of course, the bigger the availability. But if you take, say, 10 years, and you build huge capacity, which can achieve a lot, the challenge that comes, especially with the supply chain, is what do you do with all of these assets once you no longer need them, especially when we're talking about the EPC part, the construction, everything that goes with developing and bringing these to the market, and, and what we do with the capacity once we've realized a certain level. So there, there has to be an intermediacy in terms of how this is driven along, both in terms of getting the supply chain to scale up to the right levels, um, but also realizing that you don't have this kind of well-type decline that you have with an oil and gas, where you've got to consistently Re, re, kind of re, re, replenish and build, and, and build up. I think a lot of people don't think about that with an oil and gas, right? You've got a huge decline every year that has to be replaced first before you add capacity. Very different to, 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 to this type of energy. Similar with wind, I won't go with wind, very, very similar type of story in the fact that we can do it if we're going to do it in this blue line, which is why it's unfeasible. You're going to spend tons of money, money very quickly and you're going to have a huge amount of dead assets very, very quickly at the end of it. So there has to be a time integration in terms of how that happens. I think Africa's at the forefront of this. There's huge opportunity spaces, especially in terms of hydrogen, right? H how we can create green um, hydrogen using renewable energy. Um, of course, there's the, the intermittency um, aspect, but you've got hydro in, 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 in the DRC. There's various reasons and rationales to believe that, that this is something that can be integrated very effectively into both domestic energy, but also in terms of building export opportunities uh, to, to, to drive the African economy. Now, if we sum all of this up, I kept on referring to the 1.6 degree scenario because I think that's the most feasible one, and this is the one that I'm showing here. Okay? So using all those lines, if we took all those 1.6 degree scenarios, this is what we're basically saying. We're over here, okay? and I don't know if you can see. So I'll bring up some numbers. Basically, right now, around 11% of energy production okay, is coming from non-fossil fuel-driven energy sources, okay? What we're basically saying is that over time, that is going to increase. By, 2020, by 2050, globally, you can expect to see around 77% of energy production, i.e. primary energy production, coming from non-fossil fuel. So total kind of switch of roles. Of course, this is based on us driving towards these these climate scenarios, right? This is not about economics necessarily and so on, it's about policy, it's about so on, and of course, there's sensitivities to this. This is global, okay? This is, you know, we can talk about Africa and there'll be a different flavor to how this looks. Now, we've spoken about the primary energy, what does that then mean in terms of how this is brought to market? So the same chart, this is now not looking at the actual production, this is looking at how it's delivered in terms of energy type, and what you're seeing here is around 23% of energy delivered to the market is delivered in the form of electricity, okay, power. What we're saying is that by 2050, that's gonna change. You're gonna look at around 69% of all energy delivered to the market is gonna be in the form of electricity, of which kind of 32% of this is gonna be storage. Now, that, that obviously represents batteries, and, and it's about building the capacity to, to develop those batteries, and part of that battery element is, of course, um, to offset intermittency issues and various, various other elements. But this is, of, of course, um, key in, in terms of being able to sustain this type of model. It's about building the renewable 
resources, clean energy um, uh, creation, but also managing to create an infrastructure to store it and utilize it uh, when required. Now, if you then take these elements, so we've looked at the, the, the actual production, um, the, the, the way this is carried to the market, and then you look at, at the end user sector, now you can see here, we're basically going to see a steep, or we have seen a fairly steep incline. We'll consistently see an, 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 an incline in terms of demand for energy. And this is you know, split between the energy sector, industry, transport and work, buildings, homes, and so on. And then you've got this big gray part, which is losses. Okay? Now, the reality is that when energy is produced to where it's consumed, a huge amount of that energy is lost through the process, right? through, through the excavation, through the refining, um, through the transportation, and ultimately through the consumption. Now, because of the change in mix I just showed you, where we've seen a massive increase over time in terms of energy production, in the future we'll actually see a decline. Now that might sound odd, but the actual amount of energy we require is less. And the reason is quite simple, and I'll explain this here. This is the primary energy sector that we've just spoken about, and this is how much of this is utilized. Now, of course, these bars are much bigger than these bars because there's not much of it, but it's the ratios I want you to take, pay attention to. Okay? If you look at natural gas, oil, and coal, you lose nearly two-thirds of the energy by the time it's consumed. Okay? That's just, just how it is. Okay? Whereas when you're looking at green energy, it's generally between 75 to 80 percent of the energy that's produced is actually consumed by the end user. So the storyline, going back to this, is the fact that we're actually going to consistently see an increase in demand for energy, but the actual production of it will decline based on the utilization rates between green energy and fossil fuels. Interesting fact, but something to be aware of. Now, if we take this and we look at it in the context of the world, I want you to look at this. I think it tells a very stark story. Okay? If, if you look at the y-axis, this is um, the amount of energy consumed per capita. And this represents the regions, and the width of the bar represents the size of the population. Okay? So we've got North America, you know, Asia, um, so sorry, N North America, kind of Western Europe, and, 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 and Middle East fairly high in terms of consumption per capita, drops off massively to Asia Pac, which is by far the largest population, which is where you've got, of course, got China, India, and so on. Um, a bit of a drop off to South America, and then Africa's right down here. And I think this is the challenge we're all talking about here. It, 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 it's, it's how do we get this up here? And this is this whole energy poverty story, right? It's a, the case of, you know, it's not just about getting the right energy, it's about how do we create availability. And I think that's going to be a core thing to, 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 to understand. And this will rise a lot more than, than these other ones. And that's you know, a core element in terms of what we're investing in and why we're investing it. So as a reference, and I've got one more minute to go, and then I'm going to hand over to the panel. Um, this is renewable growth that we've seen in, in Africa. Now, this is utility scale. And I'll come back to kind of non-utility in terms of how we classify this. But this is wind versus solar. There should be a line here, which is around here. We're pretty much at about five, six um, uh, gigawatts here, and we're probably at around a similar amount on, 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 on solar. And you're going to see a, a steep incline. It can be even more. This is named projects, right? These are projects that are named. There's a huge blue piece in terms of what we call undiscovered in the fact that it hasn't actually been named, committed to, and so on. But the steepness of it, I think, tells a big story. But the other thing that I want you to think about is that the renewable growth, as we see it, needs to be tied to infrastructure. And that's one of the biggest challenges we have within Africa. It's not just about building wind farms and solar farms. It's how do we connect this and bring it to the people. Now, the challenge you have in Africa is most of, 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 of the infrastructure is coastal. Okay? All around, the big infrastructure, how this goes to the market is coastal. And it, it creates access issues. Now, there's two ways to kind of do this. It's building and developing the infrastructure, or it is creating kind of microgrids. And we see this a lot in, in, in Africa um, and, and other countries where you're getting more localized kind of grids on your houses, tapping into, in, in, into local networks, but it, it's not building a, a massive grid system. There's various routes to this, but this is a huge challenge for Africa. It's not just building, because we have all the requirements. We've got the space, we've got the costs, We've got the climate. And speaking at some of these other events recently, 
we get in the capital for, for these types of things. But it's about making sure that once you build them, there's an infrastructure to be able to bring this to the market in terms of where it's required. So the last thing in, in conclusion is, is, is I wanted to talk a little bit um, about hydrogen because I've just come off this hydrogen um, um, conference and hydrogen is this big game changer as we call it. And the reality is that uh, hydrogen can be in three forms, gray, blue, and green. Okay, at the moment, green is very small. It's fairly uneconomic, but has the most potential. Um, and the, the reason, the rationale for that is there's a lot of, this 51% 50, of all global emissions can be addressed by hydrogen. Okay, that's a fact. And hydrogen's, of course, battling with other sources to be able to deliver on that. But hydrogen is a very, very powerful piece of the puzzle. And if you look at Africa, it's, 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 it's fairly ag aggressively in, in, um, doing that. There's a lot of money and investment being put at it. The Germans are, are, are very aligned in terms of what they're doing in Namibia. There's various partnerships and consortiums happening. Why? Because hydrogen will be a huge demand export. Okay? Um, transport, especially around aviation, shipping, to, to potential, but massive in the, in the industrial sector. Uh, when you talk about fertilizers, we're talking about steel, we're talking about um, industrial heating. Um, hydrogen is the clean way to be able to deliver on this, and, and a lot of people are buying into this. So there's a huge amount of effort in investing in hydrogen exports, and Africa can be that player, but it takes a huge amount of electricity to create the hydrogen. And that's the challenge, right? So to create hydrogen and build this huge economic export opportunity, you've got to build the infrastructure to, to do it. And it's got to be green energy. There's no point in creating green energy and then burning coal, right? So it's, it's about creating a system that allows you to do it. So there's a lot of exciting things to happen. I'm going to pass over to the panel. I haven't spoken anything about the companies who are going to be doing this, but I think there's a huge opportunity within Africa um, for investors for players for existing companies to leverage and utilize what is a quickly transcend or a, a, a transforming landscape with huge opportunities both on the traditional oil and gas side but also when it comes to new energy and i think both play vital roles in the years to come so thank you very much Who said slides are boring? Matthew, that was excellent. It really was. No, it was great. It was great. I loved, I loved that graph with the, um, the, the two lines and the bars and so on. I actually finally started to understand something about it. Can, no, seriously, I'm not being patronized. I really mean that. It was very colorful and very good and kept everybody on their toes. Can we get the panel up onto stage, please? Give them a round of applause while they come up and then I'll get everybody to introduce themselves. Starting on the left, just for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, would you stand up and just tell us who you are and who you're from, and then we'll go down. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kola Kareem. I am... Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kola Kareem. I am the CEO of Shoreline Energy International, a family holding company, oil and gas infrastructure and investments, Pan-African. Thank you. Kola, from which country, please? From Nigeria. From Nigeria. Hey, hey, very good. Next along, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Scott Evans. I am the CEO of Recon Africa. Um, we are ex uh, exploring in Namibia and Botswana, focused on Namibia at this point. Canadian company, I'm a New Yorker, but the bulk of our company is Namibian. And with the poppy, let us not forget, lest we remember, 11th of November. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Ian Cloak. Uh, I'm the COO with a company called Aventra, uh, which stands for Africa Energy Transition. Um, we just set it up earlier this year. Uh, before that, I was with Tullow Oil uh, for 15 years, uh, working across Africa, and uh, I was privileged enough to live down here for seven years, from seven to 14. So it's uh, excellent to uh, be back here. And looking through the window, I think we have Kevin Okere. Is that right? No? He hasn't got any sound. Okay. Springfield Group of Companies. Um, Introduce we are name. primarily based in Ghana, but in other African countries. Okay, please tell us your name again. My name is Kevin. We got My it last right. name is I, Ochre. I got it. How do you say it, please? Archery. Archery. There we are. Okay. Yes. I know it's spelled different, but yeah. You know that it's my name's Jeff, spelled G-E-O-F-F, -F, G off. I mean, I'm, I'm the last <laughs> one to talk, let me tell you. Um, 
I, the panelists can talk about whatever they want, but two of the things that went through my mind while we listened to Matthew's excellent presentation was, number one, um, if you talk to police around South Africa, you'll find one of the most stolen commodities is what? It's solar panels, and this is very difficult. You put these things up in an area of poverty. And the other one is that you get wiring into high-density areas. You drive around into Soweto, Dipslut, you go around Nairobi, and at the beginning of the month, when everybody's paid, the lights are on. And at the end of the month, when you're coming at the end of payday, the lights are off, because people simply cannot afford the power that's wired to their homes. There are many other topics to talk about, but can I ask you, Kevin, to take it away and to begin, please. Um, can, can you repeat that again? Sorry. <laughs> I said you talk about whatever you like, um, but uh, <laughs> the two things that go through my head are the theft of solar panels, which is an epidemic across Africa, and the other one is how ordinary consumers get to pay for electricity. You can wire up people's homes, but if people are poor, they cannot afford the electricity that comes into their homes. And this is a great problem in terms of energy poverty. But you speak about whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you very much, Jeff. I, I think that energy security for the continent is very um, key because, I mean, we are all talking about energy transition um, at the moment, however, the only way that we can ensure that our, you know, the various citizens in various countries are okay is by providing energy security. This is the reason why I think it's very important for, you know, African-owned um, companies to play a role with um, harnessing our natural resources. Now, you were just talking about challenges of people paying for power, be it solar or whatever it is. If we don't take control or we, if we don't get involved in basically producing our natural resources on the continent. If you look at the Gulf, if you look at countries like UAE, if you look at countries like um, Saudi Arabia, they've been able to um, efficiently produce their natural resources and use that to help their citizens. So this definitely will help with industrialization, therefore by creating jobs. It will help with you know, um, education because you know, children can get power for, for school. It will help with employment in general. So. To me, um, I think the key fundamental thing over here is we being involved to ensure that whatever we earn in this industry is sort of reinvested in our communities. And by so doing, we eventually improve the lives of an average African. So whatever bill it is, be it you know, um, electricity bill or tuition or whatever it is, I feel like any security plays a key role in helping Africans become um, self-sufficient, because we've seen it done in other in, in, in other parts of the world. Um, like I said, UAE is a very small country, and um, Saudi Arabia has you know also done well for itself by using its natural resources. And I think the fundamental thing is before we start looking at going outside the continent, there's so much you know underexplored um, um, opportunities in the natural resource area in Africa that I pray and hope that a good amount of companies would look at this to help contribute our quota to our various countries. That's, that's, that, that's, how I, you know, that's my way of um, trying to contribute to help people being able to pay their bills, one way or the other. Thank you. Hey, hey. Was, uh... Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we've got a number of questions that have been put here, and what I'll do is I'll go through, um, starting with Kevin and then moving through the panels. Is that okay, guys? Can we go through? And, and, okay, very good. So the first question that I've been given here is, and this is something that um, crossed my mind uh, while I was preparing for this panel, there's obviously enormous economies of scale when you're a big company and you can lose money somewhere in Africa and you can pick it up in East Timor. You can't do that when you're an independent. So what are the primary opportunities in Africa for independence and global exploration, but also some of the challenges? Kevin, would you like to go first on that? And then we'll go through the rest of the panel. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the biggest challenge um, for independent companies in Africa is basically capital. Because, um, I mean, I see Kola Karim there, and I believe he would agree with me that you may have, you know, a blue chip opportunity. You may have a marvelous, a marvelous asset but because it's a bit more difficult in raising capital um, on the continent, a company which might have um, uh, an asset which is less attractive than yours, 
um, but it's a foreign-owned company can easily raise capital based on an asset in Africa um, to develop it. I, I also think that being an African you know, company or a homegrown company gives you a bit of an edge because you are forced to be very innovative. Because of these funding challenges, you, you are forced to be very, very efficient. Um, I can tell you that you know, we, 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 we had um, a drilling campaign which cost us about $60 million. And you know, there are similar international operators that drilled in similar water depth that it cost them about almost $90 million. But so because, you know, it's very uh, tedious for us to um, have the same kind of capital, like you said, some of these companies are very liquid, so they, you know, they could take certain risk uh, in, you know, in Namibia and lose out and find something in Peru and they are okay with it. But because we are also, you know, um, at, in early stages, we cannot make those risks. So it's very key that we pay or we, we, we try and get, you know, the, the right caliber of people we cannot afford to make the same mistakes that the, the huge multinationals who have all the capital in the world uh, can. So we need the right team, and we need just need to work. We need we just need to work efficiently. So we cannot. Yeah, we, we can take risk, but it has to be you know a well thought through risk. Can't so, be reckless. You can't be reckless. Yes, Absolutely, can be reckless. We just can because with with one or two uh, misses, you can be out. You know, whilst whilst a big merger can have you know um, the normal three miss and one hit, and they are okay. Believe with me, us, that's not only in the energy industry. One or two misses, and you can be out. I think that's pretty much in any job in the world. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, maybe except government. Yeah, sorry, sorry, everybody here from government. No. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, that's the last panel I'll be asked to moderate. Um, is the microphone, the roving microphone, who's got the roving microphone? Uh, Kole, would you like to, um, we're talking about these challenges for independence and whether there is a, a place, whether you can compete. Do you have advantages being small? Uh, you look, the biggest advantage for an independent on the continent of Africa is the ability to navigate complex areas that the big majors cannot. And if you see what's been happening the last 10 to 12 years, a lot of the major IOCs are right-sizing their portfolios and selling assets. And who are the people buying these assets? They're mainly indigenous independent companies who are trying to be more efficient in working those areas and communities better. An example for us, we've been able, we acquired the OML30 field from Shell in 2010, 2011. We took over in November 2011. Shell was producing 6,000 barrels, and today we're producing, we were 70, we're now down at 56. What did we do differently? Our engagement and form engagement with communities is different. Uh, Shell has got a very top-down approach, working on global strategy. We work on soul strategy. Um, the, the, the real key is also relationship with communities is different. I can go into the local communities and talk to the local chiefs and have a negotiation by sitting face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. The Shell executives in The Hague will not do that. So it, it, it's a very complex structure, but as an independent, I think we've got a better efficient and more penetrative relationships with communities, but is not exactly all great. We have problems as well. But the true, the true value is that ability to be nimble, to be small, and being able to be more effective. Kole, you raise a very good point there that I hear over and over again um, through this industry, but everywhere else as well. And that is in the in this age of cyber and satellites and monitoring, the best intelligence still lies on the ground. You need to get down and talk. Am I right? And you need to get down and talk to people. Please pass the microphone over. And um, Scott, would you like to add Yeah, to I'd, I'd, I'd like to build on that. I think it's a really good start because I began my career with one of those larger companies, right? I started with Exxon. Um, and you're right, so Exxon had a portfolio. And all these opportunities in that portfolio were ranked. So you may have had 30 good opportunities and maybe five get funded. The other thing about the big guys is I started, it was called Exxon. Now it's Exxon Mobil. Now the consolidation, even in the larger companies, has really uh, been, let's say, aggressive over the last few years. So there's just fewer. Instead of having nine portfolios, you're down to three portfolios. As, as an independent, 
um, I'd, I'd hearken, I'd, I'd go back to the same thoughts that you are focused. You know, uh, I'm the CEO, but I still, you know, uh, have to pick people up at the airport, have to, you know, do everything from uh, up and down the chain uh, while still keeping my eye on, on, on running the company. But you're focused. You wake up every day and this is what you think about. Now, to the point of uh, having that indigenous capability, that is really important. Now, we're an exploration company. Um, I've worked in a lot of parts in Africa, and there's, there's actually really good local uh, production capabilities. Exploration's a, a little bit harder, so we've started as, as a North American company and pulled together sort of a, uh, you know, some very, very senior geologists and explorationists. But then our focus with COVID now being able to be navigated is to build a local affiliate. So everything we do now is through Reconnaissance Energy Namibia. You know, our general manager's in the back. The, the money is spent there. We have bank accounts. And our headquarters is in Rundu, up in the Kavango. So we're trying to merge sort of the, the geology and geoscience expertise that is maybe uh, outside of the company, country with a, uh, a local field that really does the work and makes all the decisions. And as, you know, if we're fortunate to get to production, you know, those skills, I think, have been uh, grown well over the years uh, in, in Africa. Very good. Thank you. Uh, by the way, those who are wondering about the hat, um, <laughs> it's not a cowboy fetish. My wife has been asked whether he wears it in bed. Um, I, I just suffer very badly with glare. And uh, so uh, please, excuse, please excuse the hat. Um, Ian, would you like to... Uh, Pick yeah, up from I'm not that follow on independence, the hat, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, you're just I'm, jealous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just going to build actually on st really what Kola uh, started on. Um, so if you sort of step back in the global energy transition, as we look at Africa, uh, th there's a big industrial transition going on, and, and when we talk about industrial transition, it, it started with Shell, let's say, ten years ago in, in Nigeria. But really what's happening in terms of the majors, in terms of focus from a production's perspective, is what's happened naturally in, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the North Sea. Um, you know, the North Sea's been going like it for 25 years. Maybe the Gulf of Mexico's for 30. And, uh, and the North Sea's got another 25, 30 years. So when we, we looked at um, my, my co-partners uh, in, in a venture, Paul McDade, who's the ex-CEO of Tullo, Anastasia Delena, who is strategy and planning as our CFO, we, we saw this as a huge opportunity, not a challenge, in that the majors um, will be starting to exit. That, you know, in 10, 15 years, what will we see? Well, actually, you'll, you'll see a, many, many African independents, and the majors probably being in the deep water um, in LNG and probably out of that oil. Um, but that, that gives a huge opportunity uh, if you can run the operations well, uh, focused on uh, and also reducing the emissions. So that I, I think that you, although maybe the people say, well, how can you do it if you're not a major? Well, actually, you bring the A team instead of a C or D team and you apply focus, you're agile, you think local, but actually you use global uh, best practices and, and you've got to execute as quickly as possible. Uh, and you run the, the assets as quickly, as efficiently as possible to deliver value back to the, uh, the host countries. So I think there, there's an opportunity. Um, it isn't something that is strange. It, it's gone through the last 25 years in other places, and it's going to be happening in Africa now. Very good, very good. Uh, we've, through this discussion, we've actually crossed over quite a few of the questions that were given to me here. So I don't want to be repetitive, and I want to come to time for questions as well. Uh, I'm very interested in this big company, small company thing because I've worked for both. And the best big companies to work for, I've found, are the ones where the CEO behaves like she or he is running a small company and actually asks you how your daughter's flu is or how your son's done at school or, hey, it's your birthday. It doesn't really matter the size, but that personal attention. Kevin, going back to you, um, has COVID made all this difficult for you? Have you, know, you, you go through a period where you're not earning anymore. Uh, a huge company has got resources that they can rest on. Uh, you've got you and a small team of staff, whether it's their birthday or whether their child's doing well at school or not. Um, how have you coped 
right? How's your company coped and how have the people around you coped with this most outrageous of years? Is it to me? Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Jeff, yes, I mean, um, I think the pandemic really affected the entire continent, um, the entire world, actually. Um, what, what, what I've learned from this, because this is my first pandemic, is that, you know, we always will overcome. Because although initially it was very stressful, it was very difficult because no one knew exactly what was happening. Um, we, found, we found ways, we found innovative ways. We were forced to think outside the box to find much more efficient ways to work, whereby still keeping the talent that we have. Because, you know, as, a, as an independent company, privately owned, you, you, you need, I think, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name of the last gentleman that just spoke, but what he said was actually very, very, very right. You need the A team. So, you know, we, we, we could not afford to, you know, um, um, let any of our, our, our technical people or our key people go. Taking in consideration, we made a, a major discovery a few months before the pandemic, you know, really hit. And we were in the middle of actually um, 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 uh, working on a plan to, to, to develop our field further. So what we did was basically we went back and, you know, we called everyone in and said, hey, listen, from the cleaner to the board chairman. Uh, how, do we, how do we survive this? You know, we thought through as a company, and you know, that's the thing about you know, uh, a, a, a much smaller firm, you are able to engage everyone. And we all saw through ways and means of cutting um, things which we could avoid, which were, were not really needed. So we, sorry, which were not really, uh, which were not you know, very important. So we only went with stuff that were, were needed just for us to get to the face. And, um, you know, we've gone through that. Uh, right now, we are basically in a much better situation. We, I don't know if you are aware, but we had a discovery in um, 2019. Um, we are working towards um, getting into production um, um, via unitization, and, and, and we are in a much better place than we were. But what I can say is that this pandemic has basically made us um, a much more resilient, resilient firm. And, you know, I have to be thankful for all the team members for all the sacrifices that they made through, 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 and, you know, through and thin. I had to, at some point, I had to forego my entire salary and some of the key members had to forego salaries just to ensure that um, other people could, um, could, 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 will be okay. So we focused on what was very important and everything else that was not necessarily needed, we, we, we left it out. The tough yards. Um, Cole, the, who's got the microphone? Yeah. Cole, give us some thoughts, if you would. Uh, the pandemic was brutal for us um, because, like everyone else, it caught everyone unawares. Um, but it also showed us something that's very, very important in the earlier days, how so connected the world is. And that is a key driver in the decision process that we started thinking about. If you think about wherever this started from, in 40 days, the world got hit. So if you look at our businesses on the continent, like where we sit, we, in a very quick time frame, worked out how to keep our people safe, but keep the lights on and keep the operations going. And that was key to the decision-making process. The worst part of the whole scenario for us was April, 14th of April last year. We sold a cargo of crude. I've got the, the, the pricing index all framed at $14.96 at a cost of production of over $28. So you can imagine the pain. But the true fact of the matter is, do we shut down or do we keep going? And we made that decision, we need to keep going. We, we need to keep our people in a frame of mind that they want to go back, to stay on site. So what we did was we worked out a measure because most, Af most of the African countries, especially in oil and gas, did not have a framework to put operations in place on, on a continuum. So you had to devise a means from a national model that was thrown to us. So what we did was we, we talked to our operations people and kept the guys on instead of our 14 days on, seven off.
half, we kept them on a 30 cycle. And in that 30 cycle, we kept the guys tested, but it was a very strenuous um, uh, time. Again, the big problem that we saw, and, and this I'm sure goes for a lot to a lot of African independents, is we started thinking properly about our source of financing and cost of capital to an African independent. Because at the good times in oil production, you don't really feel the seven, eight, nine percent you're paying for a dollar loan. But in the downturn, like what we went through last year, where <laughs> you're losing 15 to 20 dollars a barrel of production, that seven, eight percent you're paying becomes a hundred thousand percent. So this is the brutal learning process that we've seen. But you know, the lights at the end of the tunnel. What we see today in the research in prices that we see is part of the pluses of the lack of investment in those downtimes. And that's where we're going to see stabilization in the next year or so. Looking at $100 oil, we're not far away. So that's what we as independents are looking forward to try and catch up in things we've missed in trying to balance out our safety as a business. Excellent. Colin, thank you. Thank you. Scott, have you got something? Are we actually in the oil industry or are we in the people industry? <laughs> well, uh, it's, <laughs> it's always a people industry, but in times like this, it becomes very, very apparent. I mean... The, our company started out virtual, so I suppose there was a little bit of an advantage that we become accustomed to work that way. But as I mentioned earlier, it, it, COVID made it a challenge for us to build up our Namibian affiliate as, as quickly as we wanted to. We still wanted to interview people, make sure we got uh, the best folks we can. We also had to, well, obviously, we're working closely with the ministries, and so communication with the ministries also had to uh, adapt to that, this new approach. Uh, using Zoom calls and Teams and what have you. So it frankly meant you know, a lot of long days, a lot of long nights to, to work through that, that people part. In our case, we also had, uh, because we had just really started to begin operations, including you know, uh, shipping a drilling rig from Houston uh, to here, uh, to Namibia, that is, the supply chain issues, the challenges you know, in getting things from one place to another internationally, really we had to work very hard. We had to uh, really work closely with our, our uh, transporters, our folks who had the contracts. Um, and that was, uh, again, extra effort, but we were able to make it work, but it, it was something we just had to focus on more so than normal. The other part is, you know, in an oil and gas operation, um, obviously safety is you know, the first requisite. We were actually, you know, drilling during, you know, uh, you know, uh, this year, right? And so we had to uh, put in place COVID protocols. We had to make sure that our well sites were tight and that we every day took temperatures and followed all the steps uh, internationally and through Namibian law for, for the COVID protocols. And really just had to be very focused uh, on that. Um, we also, I mean, being in the country, we saw the spikes hit. It was kind of interesting because in the U.S. it hit at one point, and there was there used to be this theory: oh, it's not going to hit in Africa. Well, it hit in Africa, and it hit hard. And so we also, you know, had to work with you know the governments to make sure that we could get the help needed to Namibia as well for for uh, for these later spikes, which thankfully I think are on their way down. But it's. Can Not I, yours we're going to forget, I don't think, for any of us. <laughs> Scott, I, I just want to ask before I go to Ian, uh, just, just show of hands around the audience. During the COVID period, did, any, did you feel that, for all its problems, did it bring you closer to the people that you work with? I don't mean physically closer, but did you come to understand your people better than before? Just put a hand up. Did it, did, it, did it bring you closer to the people you know and you work with? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, would you like to... Yeah, and I'll address it in a few, a few different ways. I mean, it, just from my experience of the industry, uh, I think this is the most brutal one that I've ever been through. Um, I mean, I joined the industry in 97, straight before oil went to about $8 in 98. I was with Exxon and then Mobil took us over. Um, but that one wasn't brutal. This, this one was brutal in its time, its ferocity, uh, and the industry... I think is, is a very, very different industry that emerges the other side with, with everything that, in some respects, is against it. Uh, but it also is a lot more efficient. 
and I think it's probably set as fair as it was uh, as in the early 2000s. I think that we're going to see quite a, a robust price rebound. Um, we, we, certainly, if you'd asked us last year, uh, it's four to, well, at minus 37 would be $85. No, uh, it's, it's responded pretty well. So, I mean, that, 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 that's the first one. I think the second one, I mean, so I, I was part of Tullow uh, for 15 years, and, and probably the last year was the most difficult one of, uh, uh, of my career. I mean, we had to shut offices. We shut an office in Cape Town. We shut an office in Dublin. Uh, we, we reduced offices across the globe. Um, uh, and the company, as sort of Tim uh, suggested a bit earlier, is not the same company that, uh, that it was. And, and that was incredibly difficult. As, uh, as you had to reduce. Um, and then that we, we started up a small company, and I'll talk sort of about the experience of uh, raising finance, because actually um, things that I wasn't really used to, Zoom and Teams, I know my kids were, but I didn't know how to press the buttons on them. We were having conversations with the US, with uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, and we were able to raise funds just like that, which, to be honest, um, probably a year ago, would have taken six months of travels in, in planes. Uh, so that type of communication technology, if we apply it to the industry, you know, virtual, um, virtual for, using the rigs, using the platforms, I don't think that's going to change now. We're going to be utilizing that and reducing uh, and making things safer. Um, and I think that's the, the sort of the last things. You can't replace face-to-face. So for all of the Zooms, for all of the, the, uh, the Teams meetings, you can't replace being in, in, in Africa. Uh, you can't replace the, these like here. So th there's always a space. You can't, just because we, we've used Zoom and Teams, it doesn't replicate it totally. It's interesting, Ian, because I've heard this comment over and over from people in business, in various types of business, who say, for all the joys of Zoom, once travel reopened, you go to London or Paris and you get half a dozen people in a room and you do more business in an hour than you've done in several months with Zoom. There's just some chemistry about getting people in a room. And thank you to all of you who have come into this room and come to join us and paid wonderful attention to it. We've got a great panel of speakers here. What I'd like to do is to, um, to go around and see if there's any questions out there. I think we've covered all the things that we've got on here. Let me come over there. I'm going to perch over there so that I can see Kevin as well. And uh, Matthew, are you willing to take some questions as well, if you've got questions? Yeah. For... Good stuff. Let me grab hold of this mic. There we are. Thank you. It's if I can... Ha-ha! Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, I, I have been told I have a loud voice. Um, let me whisper into this. Has anybody got a question here that they would like? I got right over there. In fact, somebody waving at me while I was talking. So really deserves to go first. Let me, oh God, let me try and get around. There we are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, can you just say your name and uh, what is your question? Absolutely. My name is Chinan uh, from KBR. And my question actually is, so there's a huge, if you look at um, the energy transition in Africa, there's a massive pushback and rightly so. But I just wonder, with the plummeting cost in renewables and everything, is there a risk that renewable energy technologies become way cheaper in the next couple of years beyond you know, gas or oil and all of that, and therefore we'll be left with stranded assets. Interesting. Kevin, would you like, did you hear the question, Kevin? Okay, would you like to give us some thoughts on that? And we'll go around the panel. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally think that you know, oil and gas would always play a role in this energy mix. Um, in terms of this transitional period. So I don't see, um, you know, oil and gas disappearing, you know, anywhere from now till, you know, the next 20, 30 years. I think that it will always have a role to play. But what is very important for us as players on the continent is that this is, these are the natural resources that we have been blessed with. We should look at how we can use these natural resources for the benefit of ourselves and the continent. So um, I understand that you know, they are coming up with various solutions. We um, are all looking at how we can also contribute to that. But until the time whereby our own people can also have enough for R&D 
and see how we can contribute to this energy transition with these, these new um, renewable solutions, we need to use the natural resources that we have been blessed with to help you know, elevate poverty and, and, and provide energy security for our various countries and our continent. So I don't think that is something that's gonna happen overnight. Um, when I, back in the 90s, I had heard that oil was going to be done by the year 2000, and you know, we are still here. Um, we think that you know, transition is, is good, it's going to happen, but you know, it's going to take some time, and regardless, oil and gas is gonna play some role, some key role, as we keep on finding efficient ways to actually develop these assets. Now, if you think about it, the energy industry is only second to the space industry when it comes to the use of technology. So I think as we also keep on enhancing how efficient we are producing these hydrocarbons, um, it will also contribute to something positive towards this whole energy transition. So that's, that's my personal opinion on, on, on wh where we... That's what we want, Kevin, and your personal opinion. Yeah. Anybody else <laughs> like to speak to that? Is, um, is there a risk that the falling, risk if you want to call it, that the falling cost of renewables will end up bankrupting oil, gas, coal, whatever, thermal heat in Kenya? Um, Ian, did you want to? Uh, I, I see this as a, we're, we're on a journey. Um, it's not going to be solved tomorrow. Um, and if, if you actually just look at the amount of, let's, let's fast forward 20 years. Uh, with declining, oil production is declining sort of 5% a year. And you're in the deep water, maybe 20% a year. So would Mac... Sorry, I don't know Rice Dad's uh, predictions, but uh, I think Woodmax something like there's a supply gap of about 25 million barrels a day. That's scary, really scary. Um, so I, I think we, we, we're going to still need oil for many years. When we think about the renewable transition, um, in Europe, it, it actually feels like, well, actually, all these minerals come magically. Um, they're not coming out of holes in the ground in Europe. They're coming out of places like the DRC, um, big holes in the grounds elsewhere. You know, there, there is a, a sacrifice that everybody talks about renewables. Well, actually, it comes out of the earth still. And there's going to be a huge growth in demand if we're going to go for electric cars all over the place. So I, I think that we are on a journey, we're on a transition, but we've got to also, it's got to be a managed transition. We can't leave anybody behind. So Matthew, you might be able to say on the yeah. decline. Yeah, uh, uh, just uh, again, as someone who's worked in the exploration side and the production side, uh, Ian's exactly right. You know, there's been a bit of a starvation of capital for the last few years. And so when you do that, the oil production will drop. And so that's a little bit about what you're seeing now. Or back in the States, it's the magic, uh, you know, $100 a barrel is always uh, it's sort of the litmus test for when we let things go too far. So, yeah, I think there's a generation of oil and gas uh, companies, you know, opportunities left. But it is a transition. And I think, especially for uh, newer companies, you know, there is the opportunity to take advantage of technology to, for example, uh, have no flaring. You know, that's a very reasonable thing to do. There's methane technologies that can capture them that are easier for new wells than old wells from an economic standpoint, let's say that. And there's also something that we're seeing a lot of, which is gas to power. You know, gas to power, whether it's going to the grid or it's local grid, um, especially onshore, is, is a very, very uh, powerful way to, to, to get past the energy poverty. Um, but, but again, to hearken to the other point, these are sovereign assets. You know, the countries decide how to go forward and what choices to make ultimately. It's, um, it's very interesting, that, that question, I was in Saudi Arabia two weeks ago, and, and this was the big elephant in the room. Are you guys worried that um, you find oil will just disappear? And it's, the conclusion is it's not going to happen, right? Oil is transitioned 100 years, and we're still there. And I'm sure we have many years to go. But the true position is when it comes to Africa. I think African leadership needs a different type of engagement with the global powers, so to speak, when we talk about this big thing, energy transition, clean energy, renewable energy. Because true to form, if you look at Nigeria, 90% of its foreign exchange earning capacity comes from oil. 
Now, the, the risk is this country will be wiped out if, if renewable comes into play. So there is a lot of national security implications in this drive, COP 26, 29, 32. The reality is we need to come to the table with a, with a structured engagement with the world of where we want to be. And that's the real discussion that needs to be had. There's no way we can come as Africans onto a table with a measure of the same standards that developed nations wants to be. They've go they're going on their fourth industrial revolution. We've not had one. <laughs> We've got a continent of over, over 60% under the age of 30. You can imagine the next 50 years. What are they going to do? So it's a fundamental position in African leadership that we must make decisions of conscience that actually speaks well to the teeming young population on the continent. That will drive value in time. If not, we'll have chaos on the streets of Africa. So reality is we want a better world, but also we want a world the same, that people feel safe and engaged. So it's a balancing position. Is there a threat? from renewables, I, I don't see it. Because the demand for security on the continent is going to override that, because nations are depending on these resources. There's a very, very interesting point there, that um, people living in Africa, young people living in Africa, uh, don't look at their grandparents and say, well, I've gone to school to learn algebra and Shakespeare so I can keep goats. They look at Barclays Bank or they look at uh, a law firm and say, that's where I want to be. And of course, everybody's on Facebook and watching TV. Yes, horizons have changed. Matthew. Yeah, uh, really interesting comments and I think a, lo a lot of real relevance. I think that the bottom line is energy transition means different things to different people in different places. It's, it's not a uniform storyline, right? Um, you know. Gas, oil, does it play a role? Absolutely. And, and the, it, it's a shift in the energy mix. It's not a kind of one or the other. And, and we are seeing a transition, and, and there will be declines. Um, but in, in terms of um, the, the, the cost competitiveness, you already see solar is extremely competitive and, and um, against other um, uh, forms of, 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 of creating electricity. But it's a scalability issue as well, right? You, you, the growth, and we just talk about Africa, the growth in the population, bringing energy to the people, uh, the size and scale of what you have to deliver and to do that all within renewables is massive. And like I showed you on the, on the screen, you know, the capex involved in building this, because you're building new projects, right? The gas infrastructure is there, the, the oil infrastructure is there. So in, in a lot of ways, it's leveraging what you already have. When it comes to renewables, you are having to build it from scratch and develop it. You, you don't have that depletion challenge like I showed you before, but it still has to be created. But I think the main, or one of the main reasons why I think it will stay relevant, is when we look at energy creation, it's not all about electrification in the future, right? There's a lot of roles that oil and gas play that has nothing to do with power. Uh, when we talk about um, chemicals, when we talk about other fuel types, um, and, and, and that's not so obvious, and renewables can't fill that gap. And then even if you're looking at the electrification piece, renewables has a huge intermittency issue, which it has to overcome, and that can over, only be overcome with storage, which is ultimately battery technology. And you look at, you add all the batteries in the world, it, it's not going to run a city for more than an hour, right? So... So there's a huge scalability to have to be able to replace um, these, these more kind of stabilized um, delivery mechanisms in terms of bringing energy to the people. So I'm not concerned about that. I think there's, there's enough room for everybody to play. And I think especially within Africa, to your point, we're extremely rich in natural resources. It's how you use those resources rather than what resources you use that I think is the core story. You know, it's, it's, it's responsible um, investing, focusing on your net zero targets, you know, carbon capture, um, you know, leveraging technology. All of these things are key to delivering on what we call energy transition. It's not necessarily stepping away from it, it's doing it more responsibly and, and, and more effectively. So I guess my conclusion is I, I totally believe that renewables is here to stay, but it's not here to kill anybody, it's here to live next door. <laughs> Matthew, an excellent point, an excellent point. 
I suppose every time I go and fill up my car, I do remember that uh, the tax on petrol uh, is a massive part of the fiscus. Is there going to be a tax on power from solar panels? Do we have, I know we've got a question over here. Do we have any questions from the back of the room? The people in the back of the room. Uh, let me take one of, what I'm going to do is take two questions and then, because I think that's probably where we'll wrap it up, and then we'll go through and our speakers can address both of them. So, one over here, one over there. Yes, ma'am. Give us your name and your question. Hi, everyone. My name is Marilyn. I'm a UCT student. I'm an environmentalist, but I'm an African first. And um, my question comes from the comments of um, Mr. Ian and... The last comment we got from Mr. Collar. Um, as an environmentalist, I understand there's been a lot of movement to work with energy and climate change. But as an African, I want to know from the panelists if there's any movement to work towards the environmental justice and cost of energy, like Mr. Ian said, that renewable energy, um, fossil fuel energy, is not as dirty in Europe because the wells are all in DRC, they are all in... So is there equal movement in, in, in that space of the cost to the people where all these minerals are mined and all this oil is coming from, considering what Mr. Kola has been saying, that we, the young people, want development. As Africans, we deserve it. Um, it has there been enough movement to make sure, uh, beyond activism, to make sure that the human argument and uh, the, e the equality for development for Africans and dignity for Africans in this transition is met. Are structures in place and leadership capacity being built for Africa to move towards what we need, seeing as there's a lot of focus with climate change and adaptation and technology so that we do not end in beyond the limits we need. Do we have the same happening? Do we have a direction for who's responsible for uh, the effects of the mining the, and everything that's happening? Yeah, so that is my question. Thank you. Nice question. Very good. Good question. Let me go to the other side of the room. Well, oh, there goes tomorrow morning's jog. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, Lars Janikow from Germany. I'm an energy economist and commodity trader at the same time. Um, the question on the cost is actually a huge important issue and, and unbelievable misconceptions are happening. Renewables, wind and solar are never cheaper than fossil fuels. Never, ever. And it's very simply because the cost comparisons you see are based on a marginal cost comparison. Obviously, wind and solar is free, right? But uh, the energy density, the, the intermittency, the short lifetime, the material input. Well, what's your question? The, 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 the point, no, the point is actually the comment before, because everybody was talking about it. The cost for wind and solar will never be cheaper than gas, oil, and, and coal, never, ever. So for me, the question is, what will Africa do about it? Because right now, everybody's telling that it actually is cheaper, and it's supposed to, but it's not. And we are in Africa right now, and I see a lot of pushback um, um, from the community, at least here in Africa, towards the Europeans, where I'm from as well, but I think rightly so. But um, what is Africa doing to, at the government level, and what are the small companies doing to push back on this message that we're continuously receiving and being pounded at? Um, because that, I think, is not, from my point of view, not yet enough. Yeah. I think we have interesting questions of sovereignty there as well in Africans making African decisions, and very good point over there. Would you like to go first? Kevin. Yes, um, um, I would like to take the, the first question and I'll, I'll go on the second question. Um, what, what we are doing as an African independent is basically, you know, I think we all have to be responsible. Um, we, we shouldn't just hold our governments responsible. So each and every one of us have to play a role to see what do we, what can we do in terms of enhancing our environment, especially as we are in this hydrocarbon business. What we at Springfield are doing is we are looking at, you know, we, we have various projects which basically is um, investing in our communities. So we have, you know, I think about 10,000 uh, underprivileged children that we help with um, meals, um, all their needs for school, 
their backpacks and everything. So basically, we all have to be responsible one way or the other, because I think you asked um, various questions about what, how are we trying to help you know, uh, society and stuff. We, I think that it's very key that all of us also play a role in terms of what can we do to contribute to you know, the climate change, i.e., are we going to help build trees? Are we going to help um, do things efficiently and be less wasteful? Are we going to try and print less stuff? You know, I think that the oil and gas industry has really gotten a lot of bad press, which I don't think is very well deserving because, you know, the oil and gas industry actually keeps the world moving. Now, everybody, I, I think everybody, you know, uh, in this world, one way or the other, use products that come from the oil and gas um, um, industry. When you wake up and you go and you brush your teeth, that toothbrush, that, you know, we, we, we contribute one way or the other to it. Even the batteries that they want to use for solar is, you know, to, to make the batteries themselves, we play a role to it. Your car tires, the paint, our daily livelihood, one way or the other, have some kind of effects from the industry that we are in. So we are contributing a fair quota to the world existing and the world continue to exist. Um, I read last week that I think the livestock, you know, the cattle farms and stuff actually produces more CO2 than the energy industry. And I don't think that, and I, but yet I don't see, um, you know, bad press about farmers, you know, shutting down their farms and, you know, getting rid of all the cows. Um, but, you know, the question is always about um, uh, how are we contributing to, to the environment? I think all energy companies are now really doing a lot of, we, we've done a lot of solar um, 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 power projects. We've supported that over about, almost about 200 schools with solar power and stuff like that. So we are trying to, as I said, Oil and gas is always going to be in the mix on the, on the environmental side. We are doing whatever we can. We are now trying to embark on the tree planting um, um, project to help, you know, um, the deforestation that's happening um, on, on the entire continent from, from logging, um, see how we can contribute on that side as well. So that's what we are doing at Springfield on the environmental side. Now, back to the question of what he said, I think one of the things that the second question um, um, omitted is that a lot of the countries in the West get subsidies. Um, or give subsidies to the companies producing the, you know, the, the, the other green um, solutions. Um, in, in Africa, we don't have those benefits um, as of now. But like you said, if you have to really look at cost and benefit analysis, people keep on forgetting that oil and gas are actually organic products. I mean, you drill gas from from, from the floor, you know, from, from the seabed or whatever it is. These are not things that we actually make in a lab. They are all organic um, products. And all we have to do is just keep on, you know, being very innovative on the technology side to see how we can produce these, you know, these um, um, products, not just oil and gas, all minerals, how it can be produced more efficiently and to produce less, um, le le less CO2. So that's, that's, that's my take on, uh, on both questions. Thank you very much. Jeff. Kevin raises a very good point there. Uh, West Africa has lost about 70, 80% of its forest. East Africa, about 60%. A lot of it to firewood because people just don't have another form of fuel. Very good point. What I'm going to do is close off, starting with the end, work our way around, and then Matthew gave us that great presentation at the beginning. So you can take the closing comments. So let me go over here and uh, the two questions that we had there. Um, well, with the first one, uh, it's a really, really good question. Um, and we're, we're focused on producing assets, not exploration any longer. Um, when we take over an asset, our view is that we will improve them. We will reduce the emissions. And if I use an example of one that we, we've looked at, let's say it's flaring X million scuffs a day at the moment. And if you fly over the Gulf of Guinea um, any time at night, it's, it's shocking the amount of flaring that goes on. It, uh, there's a World Bank statement that zero flaring by 2030. So everybody signed up to that. Uh, when we look at the assets, we, we basically operationalize how are we going to reduce the emissions, whether it's use more power, uh, use some of the flaring to, to the gas to generate the, the power, uh, water injection, bump up the pressure. You think about like a can of Coke, should put the, uh, the lid on the can of Coke, depressurize up, pressurize up the reservoir. Uh, to take the gas back into solution, and then ultimately put a pipeline to a local platform. So every asset that we look at, we effectively, we call it an ESG, DD, um, environmental, social, and uh, governance. So more on the environmental side, how do we improve those, those platforms? And I think that's just looking forward. We're in a race for capital. 
capital is going to go to assets which are going to be improved and, and uh, cleaner. And then a little bit of a tail. I mean, when we were in uh, Tallow, we explored for oil in uh, the Murchison Falls National Park. It's where this big oil project, uh, Telenga, is going to be developed by Total. Um, we had lions, we had elephants, we had giraffes, um, and we, we basically, by us exploring there with light foot technology, the poaching went down. Uh, it's, it's, it's a much better uh, place now than, than, it, than it was. Uh, we could see other ones, but you've got to have responsibility. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I, I think all of us have a responsibility. I try to keep going on at my kids if they want a new iPhone. Why don't they just go with the same one that I've had for three or four years? It's, um, I mean, the only way we're going to solve this is actually reducing demands across the whole population because we just can't keep, you know, the earth is the earth. It's, it's, not, it's not growing any bigger. And then, uh, sorry, really so quickly, right, right? The, um, I think the, the one on the, the second about the African governments, I think there's been a bit of a wake-up call actually in the UK uh, where there was this, we were going to become the Saudi Arabia of wind but somebody forgot to tell the climate that the wind didn't blow for two months. Uh, and then we had, obviously, gas prices went through the roof and everybody's in uproar. So it, it is a balance here. Uh, that you can't just go, you know, it's like a three-legged stool. You take one of those legs away, guess what? The stool falls over. Uh, and that's our energy mix. It's, it's got to be diverse. And I think there's been a bit of a, a lesson learned over the last few months in, in Europe, maybe. Maybe. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, so, first question, very, very good, and, and we are a pure exploration company right now, so we don't have older producing assets, but we are in an area that's never seen oil and gas before, never, doesn't, you know, hasn't, uh, it has, you know, an understanding it needs to be gained about the good and, and, and how we can do this correctly. Bottom line is, you know, we felt that even though we're on this exploration path, success so far, we still needed to commit to ESG, um, which is unusual for a company with no producing assets. So we committed 10 million Canadian to ESG, um, which right now is coming in, in, uh, in studies with wildlife of the area, um, uh, working with the agriculture and drilling uh, water wells. Water is a, a huge need uh, in, in this area. And interesting is we're geologists, there's a fantastic aquifer there, but the funds weren't there to drill water wells, and so that's, that's one of the things we're, uh, we're putting ESG dollars towards, but it's mainly studying, making sure that we are uh, in constant uh, communication with the, with the people in the area to know what's, what we're doing, what, what a seismic survey is, you know, why these wells will, uh, you know, when, when, when we're done with them, there will be no harm left behind. Um, and then that we also have the benefit of, of new technologies, I mentioned, uh, you know, methane capture. Methane capture is a, if you've ever been to a real producing oil field, it's a big deal. And some of these wells, economically, you can't necessarily rehabilitate them. But for new wells, there's technologies where you can. And so we're working in partnerships uh, in that area. And then again, the concept of gas to power, um, which is uh, in many parts of the world, off-grid, so just local communities generate their own power, is powerful. and I. I think it's going to be a real game changer for Africa, but it's still new technologies. Uh, to the second point, um, you know, in the U.S., in the past, when we were trying to develop new energy resources, we would provide tax breaks, right? That's sort of the, the medicine that's always used. It's not available here. So I'm in with everybody else is how do you get to that point where you get over the economic hurdles that uh, the previous question questioner asked? You know, you have to look at it um, practically and look at it, like we say, as a transition. To talk about hydrogen, I mean, there's blue hydrogen, which does use gas to, to generate it out. That's reasonable. In some places, you may have to do that where you don't have uh, access to solar, right? But it's still hydrogen. It's still good. So there's, there's a range of things that I think need to be mixed and matched. So thanks. Um, global... To, to the question from, from, from the lady, I think global activism has actually pronounced climate problems and also reinforced ESGs. And to corporate companies, that social responsibility is now setting 
on management and drivers in making sure you do the right thing. And I think that's in the forefront of what's driving decisions today. So when we are in communities, we're now making sure our flares are being captured and re-injected and, and, you know, into power and processing to power and stuff like that. So the, whatever happens, where the world is going is on a trajectory that you will have to conform. You can't go back. The days of just doing what you want is gone. If, you're not, if the government's not forcing you to do it, your bankers will force you to do it. So those are sticking principles is changing and is going to divert or urgently, continuously change the game plan. The, on the other question on government, I'll tell you something I saw about two months ago. Uh, and it's amazing because you just stuck with me. In the California desert, they had a charging station for batteries, electric cars. And that charging station was being recharged by a truck with a generator, a diesel fuel generator. And you know, it goes back to the question earlier. <laughs> Oil is not, fossil fuel's not going anywhere, right? It will work together and government's responsibility is now becoming more pronounced because global norms is coming to play. So when we talk about subsidies, I'm not sure African countries have that uh, kind of cash support to support businesses, but in time, we're seeing already government is giving tax breaks to gas development in Nigeria. That's a form of subsidy to help us put more emphasis on gas development. So you're going to see a lot of innovative ideas from government in making sure the utilization uptake is getting better. Thank you. I wasn't laughing at your comment. I was laughing. I've just had a message that ESCOM's announced there'll be load shedding in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> so the lights are going off. Matthew, I suggest you make it quick, my brother. Yeah, I think really, really good comments. And, you know, not somebody who's sitting, sitting in, in the industry as a player, I'll, I'll maybe kind of create it more high level. If we think about the recent kind of past within energy, I kind of divide it into three very distinct chapters. So if you're going up to kind of 2014, we were very much in, in the kind of productivity phase. It was drill more, explore more, get more, $100. It was all about... Um, um, volumes, right, and 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 productivity. After after the the, the crash in tw in 2014, 2015, the thematics changed massively, and 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 then it was much more about efficiencies, right? It was about cost management. It was about reducing um, your your overheads, doing what you can do in a more efficient and costly manner, and 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 the volumes took a secondary importance to that. And then I would say, you know. Coming into COVID, and certainly coming out of COVID, we've gone into a new chapter, which is a sustainability chapter. And, 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 and now, it's not how much you produce or how much it costs, it's how responsible you are in doing it. And I, I think that, for everybody in the room, and everybody in the world, really, is something that you can't avoid. Because the money, the ability to do things, um, and, 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 and the policies and so on are very much driven by all of these types of topics. So if you are an independent player, or you're a government, or you are, are a, a, a major, or whoever it is, you have to play within certain rules because there are, there are responsibilities. And if you don't, guess what happens to your share price? Guess what happens to your funding? Guess what happens to your investors? So you can't avoid these things. And, and for that reason, I think everybody has to play that game. They don't have a choice. Um, but you will still have pure play EMP companies, because there is still a market for it. There'll still be exploration companies, because you still need frontier exploration. We still need economic barrels brought to the market. There's, there's no doubt about that. And I guess that's what I was saying at the beginning, is it, it's a balance of understanding the roles you play and how this um, transition plays out. And I think to the question of costs, I think also super relevant, um, because everything in the world is about supply and demand, right? And, and if you want to go out there and you want to drive up renewable development and capacity, guess what? As much as you're not drilling something in the ground and extracting it, and you know, uh, fossil fuels as a commodity are things that you can store, you can physically hold, that you can move around. Electricity isn't. But even so, to develop these things, there is still resources required, right? There's energy metals that are, are, are vital to build 
solar farms and, and you know, the demand for those metals as you develop will incrementally impact the marginal costs of bringing that to market. So there is a kind of sway, and, and at the moment we are offsetting that with, with um, 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 incentive schemes, policies, um, tax um, and benefits, uh, carbon schemes, and so on. But the, the, the end of the day is, is there is a marginal cost. So I 100% agree um, that you know, which, whichever way you look at it, just the laws of economics are going to kind of make things certainly more or less cost efficient. So hopefully that made a bit of sense. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I'm sure the, you've all seen the pictures that have gone around of the uh, COP conference and there's a line of current and former heads of state all in various stages of falling asleep. Not the audience here. Give yourselves a big hand. You have been a wonderful audience. Attentive, good questions. And please would our panelists stand up, including Kevin and take a bow. You have been great. Kylie had to go to another session. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a wonderful Africa Energy Week. Thank you to Kevin. Cheers. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much.